Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome to worship at Crossroads Presbyterian Church for Sunday, May the 10th. My name is Susan Seitzma Bratt and I serve as pastor here. Whether you are tuning in for the first time or you are a longtime member, we hope you find this service to be one that is uplifting, grounding, and a source of comfort and hope. During this time of Safer at Home, I wanted you to know that we have opportunities to provide care and support. So if you are in need of prayer, of a listening ear, of someone to get groceries for you because you are homebound, please do not hesitate to reach out to Congregational Care Director Kim Steffen or myself. Also, if you have a prayer concern or a joy, you can email them to prayers at crossroadspres.org. They are compiled and put into our weekly prayer web for our congregation members and staff to pray over. Or if you just need someone to know of a prayer request and don't want it to be shared, simply indicate that in your email. We long to pray for you and join in support. Ministry continues here at Crossroads and our youth are continuing to sell mulch. If you would like to order mulch, to have delivered as a fundraiser for our youth, simply reach out to Dave Carpenter. And also, while we continue with safer at home measures here in Wisconsin, please know that our ministry continues. Every day we have between four and seven different Zoom meetings, whether it's a small group Bible study that's meeting or ministry teams, the work of our church continues. If you would like to learn more about how to plug and connect, simply go to our homepage. We have a Crossroads at Home section where you can find devotional resources, Sunday school lessons, previous worship videos, and information about online small group opportunities for learning and support. Finally, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection, I announced to you the death of Chuck Harmon. Chuck died last week, Friday, May the 1st, a memorial service for Chuck is postponed given COVID-19 to be determined at a later date. Please keep Chuck's family in your prayers. Daughters Renee and Charlene are active members here, as well as Chuck's wife, Jan Harmon. Although we worship in different places, we worship together and spirit in truth. Please join me in the responsive call to worship that you will find on your screen. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. We long for abiding peace and friendship that renews our souls. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. We see wisdom that endures and guidance for our journey. Jesus says, where I am, there you may be also. We come to encounter Christ. Let us worship our God.
waters or go through times of trial, the Lord our God is with us. With confidence in God, our Creator and Redeemer, let us confess our sin by praying these words together. Holy God, in baptism you claim us as beloved children and set us apart as witnesses to your love. At times we forget we bear the mark of your grace and we act as if you have no claim on our lives. You call us to the risky work of justice and peace, but we default to what is comfortable and safe. You call us to ministries of generosity and compassion, but we make little room in our lives for gestures of mercy beyond moments of spontaneous kindness. Wash us again with your grace and transform us by your word that we might proclaim your gospel in word and deed. Amen. Hear the good news. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so we sing together. Bless the Lord. So 
Good morning. It is a wonderful morning. It's Mother's Day, and I'm so glad that I get to be here to share a special message with you this morning. Lizzie, what on earth are you doing? I'm measuring your love for me. What do you mean you're measuring my love for you? Well, you've always told me throughout the years that you love me this much, and I want to see how much that really is, so I'm measuring. Oh, that's something we like to say to show our kids that we love them so much, but it's not really something you can measure. What do you mean? Well, I mean, my love for you is bigger than my arms could ever stretch. In fact, if you had a measuring tape that went all around the world, it still wouldn't be long enough. Really? Yes, really. And do you know who loves you even more than me? God? That's right. God's love for all of his children is bigger than we could ever imagine. His love is so enormous. If he had a measuring tape that went on and on forever, it still wouldn't be long enough. And he, not only that, but he has enough love for all of his children. He wants us to share that love with others as well. But how can we do that when we have to be separated from others right now? That's a really good question. Well, we could write letters to our neighbors. We could FaceTime and Zoom call our friends and family, and we can remember to pray for each other and let each other know that we're praying for each other. You know, these are really uncertain times for us, but they're not uncertain times for God. He is always the same loving Father, and He will continue to love us and be with us no matter what happens. He wants us to remember that love and to share it with others. We may just have to be a bit more creative in how we do that right now. Thanks, Mom. You're welcome. Anytime. You know what? Let's pray right now. Let's fold our hands together. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much that we could never measure it, even if we tried. Thank you for putting people in our lives to help us learn about your great love and be with us as we share that love with others. Help us to feel safe knowing that you are the same loving God you've always been and will always be and that you will never leave us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray together. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might hear your word with joy. In your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning is from Psalm 31, selected verses, verses 1 through 5 and 15 through 16. Hear God's word for us this morning. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily, be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me not out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. So deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second passage is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. This story takes place on the evening of Monday, Thursday. Jesus has gathered with his disciples in the upper room, and he is teaching and preaching to them one final time. You could say this is his final sermon to them. Hear God's word. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus began our passage with these words, Do not let your hearts be troubled. I hear these words, and at first blush, I have a confession to make. Some cynicism rises up in me because there is plenty in our world to trouble our hearts. Maybe your heart is troubled as you see your business struggle. Maybe your heart is troubled as you have been furloughed or laid off, as you've lost your job and are wondering when you'll be able to find a new job, how you will pay your bills. Maybe your heart is troubled because you cannot hug your grandchild or see your loved ones in the ways in which you are accustomed. 
Maybe your heart is troubled because it's Mother's Day and it's a hard day because of grief, loss, unmet dreams. Grief piles on grief and our hearts are troubled. There is plenty to be troubled about, plenty to fear. Life is unpredictable and joys and sorrows come in and out of our life just like water or the sea as a tide comes in and out. We are living with this reality right now as a virus and concern and care for others means that we are living differently. We are slowing down, we are staying home, we are following the orders to be safer at home. We're living so differently in fact that none of us probably have ever lived this way before in our lives. But we are not the first to have troubled hearts or to walk through the storms of life. Back in 1871, a fire ravaged the city of Chicago. In fact, it even spread across Lake Michigan to my hometown of Holland, Michigan. Homes and businesses were lost in an instant and lives were lost. Horatio Spafford was a successful attorney and real estate investor in Chicago at that time. His family lost everything in that Chicago fire. But Horatio didn't just lose his business or his livelihood. His four-year-old son also died of scarlet fever. So in the wake of that devastating loss, not only to his family, but to his community, Horatio sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England to go away, to take a trip. He stayed behind. While crossing the Atlantic, the ship was involved in an accident and it sank. And more than 200 people died, including Horatio's four daughters. His wife, Anna, survived and made it safely to England. And she sent Horatio a telegram saying, saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England. Faced with communal tragedy and now family tragedy, grief upon grief, I imagine that voyage was one of pensive thought. When the ship passed over the site of the shipwreck where his daughters died, the captain came and pointed it out to him so that he could pause and say a prayer. It said that Horatio was overcome with a sense of God's presence and comfort. And so while on this voyage, he penned these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. This poem goes on and would be set to music and become the well-loved hymn, it is well with my soul. Indeed, there are storms in life. There is sorrow and sea billows roll. And yet while all is not well in our lives, fundamentally, all is well with our soul. Jesus is talking to the disciples in this passage on Maundy Thursday evening. If you look back to John chapter 13, which we didn't read today, you'll see that Jesus has washed his disciples' feet. He has betrayed that he has predicted that he will be betrayed. He has said to Peter that he will be denied by him. Jesus has reminding them again and again throughout this evening that he is going to die and they will have to continue without Jesus being physically with them. The disciples have plenty to be troubled about. They are troubled by grief and fear about his intending death. They are troubled that one of them will betray him, that Peter will deny him. They are troubled that Jesus will leave them and they will be alone, left to carry on his ministry. How can they do this without Jesus? Their hearts are troubled because they cannot imagine life on earth, ministry, without Jesus. And so they're struggling to know how to go on. 
And so Jesus takes this moment, this intimate evening, this dinnertime conversation to teach them, to preach to them one more time. Our passage for today is a farewell sermon, almost like a, a graduation address, if you will, and it's meant up to sum up their journey together and to give them hope, comfort, to remind them of their calling. Jesus gives this sermon to teach the disciples how they must live when he is gone, how to have faith when they are isolated, when Jesus is no longer physically with them. So what does Jesus say in the face of their grief and fear, their troubled hearts? He doesn't just say, don't let your hearts be troubled and stop there or say, buck up, keep going. No, what follows is an invitation for them to be vulnerable, to trust Jesus, to believe in Jesus. And Jesus gives them a promise. I am preparing a place for you, a house where you will live and dwell, and you know the way. But in verse 5, Thomas asks, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? This is a fair question. Thomas and his disciples are often confused because Jesus is talking in eschatological, big picture, heavenly terms, and they're still talking in day-to-day, life-on-the-ground terms. Jesus pushes back and clarifies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know enough because you know me. You've been in relationship with me. You've followed me. This way, this journey, your calling now is all about relationship, which means there aren't steps to follow. There isn't a formula, seven highly effective steps of being a disciple. No, to follow Jesus means there's dynamism, there's relationship, there's trust, there's movement. In fact, trust is the antidote for the troubled heart. Trust me. Follow me. You've been equipped for this journey, Jesus says. You've got this. You've got this because you know me and we've been in relationship. The Gospel of John uses this word pistuo, believe, 98 times. In John, it's always a verb. To believe is to take an action, to be in a relationship, to trust. Jesus then follows up this invitation to believe and to trust with this gift of eternal life. He gives them hope. He gives them a sense of belonging, of purpose. Jesus doesn't just charge the disciples to be strong. No, Jesus encourages the disciples to be vulnerable, to trust. To trust in their relationship that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, fully human and fully divine. To trust that there is something after death, a dwelling place, a home with many rooms where they will have a place. Jesus also encourages them to drop their excuses, to trust that they know enough and are equipped to do a greater work even than Jesus himself. So in this moment, in this evening where Jesus is inviting them to trust, he's also inviting them to enter into a deeper, fuller relationship with him. They're no longer following Jesus, following behind him. No, they are step by step with Jesus and they will continue on without him. This sort of relationship requires trust, but also love. Reverend Dr. Erin Rafferty is a child of Crossroads, and she wrote a powerful commentary about our passage for today, about the vulnerability and love that's required when we trust Jesus. Erin is a Presbyterian pastor and a professor of youth ministry at Princeton Theological Seminary, She's also a mother to a beautiful daughter, Lucia, who is disabled and has a terminal illness. Erin writes, I've never been able to save my daughter, Lucia. It's a truth I've had to come to grips with. 
When you live at the edge of your limits as a mother and a person, you get comfortable there. You make a home and peace among the unanswerable whys. You realize to ask why is futile. Distancing, faithless, daunting. The control that you don't have was never an idol to be worshipped, but rather a tyrannical robber of joy. We can't save ourselves. We can't prevent this virus. If we could, we would have done it by now. Instead, our lives are shot through with daily reminders of our vulnerability. And Aaron goes on. Grief and love are the twin conditions in which we've had to make our home in these coronavirus days. To acknowledge the former, grief in light of isolation and suspended gatherings doesn't always seem to help. In other words, it doesn't help to know what you're going that what you're going through is grief in these days when it seems like it's grief upon grief. The paradoxical antidote though in the face of this grief is to be ridiculously committed to loving people. The grief is that love never rescues anyone from death. But the love covers them. Love nurtures them. Love consumes them in a way that always does and matters completely. Grief and death may be more evident these days, but perhaps there's salvation to be found. While we can't save ourselves, may we be reminded that the God who saves has been unleashed in the world as love incarnate. Love will conquer death. Love will find a way. Jesus tells his disciples who are grief stricken, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. Follow me. Trust me. I gave you a love that conquers all, a love that allows you to love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Friends in Christ, the challenge, the invitation for us as modern day disciples is to continue to walk through this pandemic experience with love. The gift of the cross is that we all have a home. We will dwell with God. It is well with our souls. So let not our hearts be troubled, but let them be filled with faith, hope, and love. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of us all, Amen. The season of Easter is when the Church has traditionally performed baptisms for new believers, affirming their faith in the basic tenets of Christianity. Let us now join together with our bodies, our minds, our voices, and confess our faith with the Church Universal using the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe?
And now let us join our hearts and minds together as we lift up the needs of ourselves and our world together in our prayers of the people. Let us pray. Creator God, you knit us together in our mother's womb. And so we praise you for we are all fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. We thank you that you invite us to gather as, you pe as your people. You hem us in before and behind. And so we pray for those who, like Naomi, find themselves parenting someone outside the predictable patterns. Bless this day all widows and widowers, single parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, foster parents, adoptive parents, teachers, and all those who care for children. And we pray this day for those who, like Ruth, have become caregivers for their elders. Because the generations that need to be parented and the seasons of our life can change, we sometimes find ourselves nurturing those who have even forgotten who we are. We take strength in knowing that you remember their identity when they no longer do. Grant courage and strength to all those who provide care in your name. We pray for those who, like Hannah, have struggled with the task of letting go of a child. Teach us to support our children, even when the calling of their hearts does not meet our greatest hope for them. We pray for those who, like Mary or Rachel, have known the deepest agony of a child's death. Remind them again that nothing can separate their child from your love. Give strength and peace to those who mourn and those who cannot stop mourning. We pray for those who, like Sarah, have known the struggle to conceive. We pray that you would hold them in their heartache. We pray this day, O God, for the leaders of their world. Grant them wisdom and courage to care for the least of these. We pray for those who are struggling, who are struggling with mental health given isolation, with violence in homes, with not enough. We lift up those who are unemployed and underemployed, those facing economic uncertainty. We pray for business owners who are making tough decisions, whose livelihoods and vocations are on the line. We also pray this day, O Lord, for all who are sick, for all who are battling chronic illness, grant healing to those who are sick, and particular measures of patience and stamina to all those offering care right now. God of comfort, we mourn with those who mourn. And so we pray that you would grant hope to the dying and peace to their loved ones, especially if they are unable to be present. May they sense you as a shepherd with them in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. Hold all of your children close this day and every day. And now we pray with one voice in the name of your child who came that we would all have life. Jesus Christ, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we pause to give thanks to God for the blessings we have received for the abundant grace that Christ gives us. And we dedicate a portion of our lives, our time, our talent, and our treasure back to the glory of God. Thank you for pledging online and for mailing your checks to Crossroads Presbyterian Church. During this offertory, let us reflect on how we might share God's love in the coming week.
high on every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord. You never let go of me. provide for us. We offer you our gifts, signs of your gracious love, and tokens of our grateful hearts. Use them to proclaim to all the world your triumphant love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Psalms encourage us to trust and have hope, even in the middle of trials and difficulties. Let's sing together and praise God, our refuge and strength.
and now receive this charge. Go out into God's world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all persons, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the abundant love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us all. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.